the work depicts the diaries of three characters uh, traveling the Levant in 1929. Uh, one of them I'm going to recite, and the two, one is a text on, in the video, and the other is me as well in the video. August 5th, 1929. We were only one little hour's travel within the northern borders of the Holy Land. We had hardly begun to appreciate it, that we were standing upon any different sort of earth than that we had always been used to, and see how the historic names began already to cluster. Dan, Bashan, Lake Hula, the sources of Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee. The little township of Bashan was once a kingdom, uh, so famous in scripture for its bulls and its oaks. Lake Hula is a biblical waters of Meron. Dan was the northern limit of Palestine, and Beersheba the southern, hence the expression from Dan to Beersheba. It is equivalent to our phrase from Maine to Texas, from Baltimore to San Francisco. Our expression and that of the Israelites both mean the same, indicating great distance. With their slow camels and asses, it was about seven days' journey from Dan to Beersheba. Say 150 or 60 miles, it was the entire length of their country and was not to be undertaken without great preparation and much ceremony. Palestine is only from 40 to 60 miles wide. The state of Missouri could be split into three Palestines and there would be enough material for another part. Jerusalem, Monday, 3rd of December, 1928. In the morning, I stopped by the governor's office, which is housed in the British Archbishop headquarters, to pick the travel document, but I didn't find anyone there. I have no idea why the British wants to deport me from Jerusalem. Why me? Someone who is only suitable as a teacher and only happy when busy with my work. Whether the Ottomans or Germans took over the country or whether it remains in the hands of the British, I will only work in education and will only teach what my conscience counsels. I will not carry anyone's favor, nor will I serve anyone's gold. At any rate, it does not concern me whether the British stay in this country or not, for I have decided that if I survive these times, I will travel to America and put my son into school there. And wherever I am, I'm simply a human being, nothing else. I don't belong to political parties or religious factions. I consider myself a patriot wherever I am and strive to improve my surroundings, whether they are American, British, French, Ottoman or African, whether they are Christian, Muslim or pagan. I only work to serve knowledge and knowledge has no homeland. What is a patriot? If being a patriot means to be sound of body, strong, active, enlightened, moral, affable, and kind, then I am a patriot. But if patriotism means favoring one school over another and showing one's brother's hostility, if he is from a different school or country, then I'm not a patriot. August 5th, 1929. We moved on. We were now in a green valley, five or six miles wide and 15 long. The streams which are called the sources of the Jordan River flow through it to the Lake of Hula. A shallow pond, three miles in diameter, and from the southern extremity of the lake, the concentrated Jordan River flows out. The lake is surrounded by a broad marsh, grown with reeds. Between the marsh and the mountains, which wall the valley, is a respectable strip of fertile land. At the end of the valley towards Dan, as much as half of the land is solid and fertile and watered by the Jordan sources. Here were evidence of cultivation, a rare sight in this country. An acre or two of rich soil studded with the last season dead corn stalks of the thickness of your thumb and very wide apart. But in such a land, it was a thrilling spectacle close to, close to the stream, 
uh, and on its banks a great herd of curious-looking Syrian goats or she and sheep were gracefully eating gravel. I do not state this as a, a petrified fact. Uh, I only suppose they were eating gravel because they did not appear to have anything else to eat. The shepherds that tended them were very picture of Joseph and his brethren. I have no doubt in the word. These chaps would sell their younger brothers if they had the chance, I think. They have the manners, the customs, and the dress, and the occupation, and loose principles of the ancient stock. Damascus, Tuesday, 18th of December, 1928. When I went to bed that evening, it was late and biting cold, and cannons near Jerusalem were booming like thunder. Then there was a soft knock at the door. I opened it to find an American Jew standing before me, like a frightened soul seeking refuge. He informed me that he is wanted by the French High Commissioner of Syria and Lebanon in Damascus, and the British had announced that he must turn himself over within 24 hours, and that if he failed to do so, he'd be considered a spy. It had also been announced that anyone who intentionally or unwittingly hid him would likewise be considered a spy. Our friend had not turned himself over to the government, but had fled, and perhaps had knocked on many doors before reaching mine, because no one would welcome him in. And so I was trapped. Should I admit him, thus disobeying the orders of the British government and making myself subject to its wrath and vengeance, particularly at, at these days where the government has lost its sense? Or should I send him back to whither he came, thus breaking with the social grace of my cultural idioms, which I became so enamored of at an early stage, and which I have committed myself to preserving and indeed strengthening. If I let him in, I would betray the British, and if I sent him away, I would betray my cultural idiom. So which betrayal should I commit? He is seeking refuge with the Bedouin who offered sanctuary to the hyena when it sought shelter from its pursuers in his tent, who protected the locusts crawling over his land and those pursuing them to ward off the calamities they cause. I believed that I was safe and that no one would pay any attention to the man who had sought refuge with me. But at three in the morning on Wednesday, while I was peacefully asleep, a harsh knock sounded on the door. Who was knocking? Who was knocking? Another soul seeking refuge? So I leapt from my bed and went to our friend's room and knocked on his door in the hope that I would be able to help him escape, but he did not wake. The soldiers were at the house's inner door, and so there was no option other than surrender. I went to the door and opened it to find a British officer and an old woman who had come along to guide them to the house. He said, where is the American poet? And I led him in into his room. They woke him up and took both of us away. I was certain that we were doomed, and so I bade my loved ones a final farewell upon leaving with the soldier. August 5th, 1929. They had with them the pygmy jackasses one sees all over Syria and remembers in all pictures of the flight into Egypt, where Mary and the young child are riding and Joseph is wo wo walking alongside, towering high above the little donkey's shoulders. But really, here the man rides and carries the child as a general thing, and the woman walks. The customs have not changed since Joseph's time. We would not have in our houses a picture representing Joseph writing and Mary walking. We would see profanation in it, but a Syrian Christian would not. I know that hereafter, the picture I first spoke of will look odd to me. 
We saw water, but nowhere in all the waste around was there a foot of shade. And we were scorching to death, like unto the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Nothing in the Bible is more beautiful than that. And surely there is no place we have wandered to that is able to give it such touching expression at, as this blistering, naked, treeless land. Here, you do not stop just when you please, but when you can. We found water, but no shade. We traveled on and found a tree at last, but no water. Damascus, Tuesday, 18th of December, 1928. They took me to the military station in the Dominican building, that, and there I ran into Sheikh Abdurrahman Salam, professor of Arabic in the Salhiya College. They had arrested him so as to send him to Damascus and place him in the Salhiya College there. Since I had transferred there just a few days earlier, I approached him and said, Professor, you may be the last person I see in this life, so know that that I was, until the end, virtuous and upright. He gave me his support and lifted my spirit. We stayed in the police station for two days, and then we were transferred to a military prison in the Russian building, where they put us in a private room with eight others, some of whom were shackled with chains and barred us from mixing with the other prisoners. We were certain that they considered us major criminals. Then they bound us with ropes that night, tying each of our hands to another's, myself and the poet and the eight others, three Turks, an Egyptian, two from the Gendarmen, two Jerusalemites, one of them called Khaled, and the other Yusuf as shihabi Abu Ribah. We walked on the road to Jericho, and we came across a cave in our path. And the head guard issued an order for us to halt, and we stopped. They took us into the cave and said, Sleep a little here. And our companions immediately lay down on the ground and slept. I was surprised at how someone in these circumstances could sleep. As for my companion and me, we could not sit down because our shackles were so tight. If one of us sat, the other would fall on top of him. One of our companions said, Please sit near me and ward off the cold, for my clothing is very thin. I was extremely saddened by his condition. Shortly thereafter, we got up and continued walking until the sun rose high in the sky and planes soared over our heads. We reached Jericho, which was teeming with vanquished soldiers and officers. Every passerby turned us a blind eye and a deaf ear. They had every right to do so in order not to be taken as guilty by association with us. Before long, however, I saw the honorable young man, Michel Kazaz, one of my students. He was alarmed at the sight of my condition and couldn't help himself from approaching me, not even asking permission. He was on the verge of tears. He brought us some chairs and we sat and he brought us some coffee which we drank. After some time, Sama'an al-Khuri arrived with a little girl carrying a basket of food. He stood at the door and gave me the basket, encouraging me, and I thanked him. In the morning, Michel Qazaz came again, carrying another basket of food with enough for all of us for several days. I took it and we walked on as I retired my gratitude for this boy's generosity of spirit. When night fell, we were still a long way from assault, and so our guards decided that we would spend the night in a cave at the base of the mountains that was used as shelter by the Americans working the road. Early next day, we walked onto assault. 
It was a beautiful morning, and one of our companions, who was black and from Izmir, started singing. The, gar the guards fired rounds into the air for amusement, as though conquering raiders. When we arrived in Assalt, they took us to some falling down and deserted homes and stood guard at the doors. I immediately wrote two letters, one to Ahmad Afandi, Abdul Mahdi, and the other to my friend Shukri Khalil Jamal, because I knew he was in Assalt. Before sunrise on Wednesday morning, we walked to Amman, where we were put in prison again. As we entered, I saw some people I knew and called out to them, but they shunned us all but Mr. Baramki, who works in Amman. He sent a young boy to me who brought us water and everything else we needed. Then we left Amman before dawn and walked to the station. We rode the train to Dura, arriving in the evening. It was extremely cold and the sky war warned of rain. We peered from the train window, hoping to see someone we knew, and I saw Mr. Shukri al Khuri. I greeted him from afar and beckoned to him, and he returned my greeting but did not approach. Perhaps he feared being suspected of something. Then one of my most gifted students passed by, George Khamis. I called to him, and he came, and when he saw me in fetters, he was horrified and his eyes filled with tears. He asked me what I needed and then went to get what food and other necessities were available and I thanked him. We slept on the train that night and in the morning the train took us to Damascus. We arrived on Wednesday 14th of December 1928 and were handed over to the district commander. We shortly thereafter, they transferred us to the Al Mu'allaq Mosque prison in Al Jabiya Gate, in front of the Mithat Pasha market. We spent our first night in a small room where I was unable to find enough room to sit, let alone sleep. This is the room new inmates are placed in before they are bathed, their clothes are sanitized, and they are transferred to detention. On Saturday morning, they escorted us fettered with metal shackles to the baths. That evening, I had managed to send a message to my most loyal friend, a principled man with fine morals, Mr. Mitri Tadros, to inform him of my state. In the afternoon, Mitri Tadros and my distinguished teacher, Mr. Nahle Zreik, visited me. When we were students, one of our grammar lessons was the verse of poetry. To suffer at one's imprisonment, ruin, longing, exile, and separation from the beloved is too much to bear. And so when I saw my teacher, I said to him, to suffer at one's imprisonment, ruin, longing, exile, and separation from the beloved. And he replied from the other side of the metal bars, is too much to bear, as his eyes filled with tears. August 6, 1929. We rested and lunched and left the station and came on to this place, Ain Meleha. The boys call it Baldwinsville. It was a very short stay run, but the dragoman does not want to go further and has invented a plausible lie about the country beyond this being infested by ferocious Arabs who would make sleeping in their midst a dangerous pastime. Well, they ought to be dangerous. They carry a rusty old weather-beaten flintlock gun with a barrel that is longer than themselves, weapons that would hang fire just about long enough for you to walk out of range and then burst and blow the Arab's head off. Exceedingly dangerous the sons of the desert are. It used to make my blood run cold to read the words of W.M.C. Grimm's about his escapes from Bedouins. But I think I could read his work now without any tremor. He never said he, wasn't he was attacked by Bedouins, I believe, or was ever treated uncivilly. But I like his work 
on the poor wandering boy with his weary feet and his dim eyes in such fearful danger while he was thinking for the last time of his old homestead and his dear church and the cow and those things and of finally straightening his form to its utmost high in the saddle, drawing his trusty revolver, and then dashing the spurs into Muhammad, and sweeping down upon their ferocious enemy, determining to sell his life as dearly as possible. Damascus, Sunday, 6th of January, 1928. How I need a chair during the day, even a cafe chair would do. To sit on and smoke my water pipe and read whatever books I have, or write down my thoughts. But I don't, I don't have a chair, and so I'm forced to sit on the edge of the bed and use my knees as a table for writing. I don't write much before my legs go numb and I can no longer move. Despite this, I might grow accustomed to these circumstances, but I cannot hold back my tears or stop my heart from being broken. August 6, 1929. I can see easily enough that if I wish to profit by this tour and come to a correct understanding of the matters of interest connected with it, I must studiously and faithfully unlearn a great many things I have somehow absorbed concerning Palestine. I must begin a system of reduction, like Moses' spies boring the grapes out of the promised land. I have got everything in Palestine on too large a scale. Some of my ideas were wild enough. The word Palestine always brought to my mind a vague suggestion of a country as large as the United States. I do not know why, but such was the case. I suppose it was because I could not conceive of a small country having so large of a history. I think I was a little bit surprised to find that the Grand Sultan of Turkey was a man of only ordinary size. I must try to reduce my ideas of Palestine to a more reasonable shape. One gets large impressions in boyhood sometimes, which has, he has to fight against all his life. All these kings, when I used to read that in Sunday school, it suggested to me that several kings of such countries as England, France, Spain, Germany, Russia, etc., arrayed in splendid robes, ablaze with jewels, marching in grave procession, with scepters of gold in their hands and flashing crowns upon their heads. But here, after coming through Syria and after giving serious study to the character customs of the country. The phrase, all these kings, loses its grandeur. It suggests only a parcel of petty chiefs, ill-clad and ill-conditioned savages, much like our Indians who lived in full sight of each other and whose kingdoms were large when they were five miles square and contained 2,000 souls. Damascus, Monday. 7th of January 1929. Today is the Eastern Orthodox Christmas. I'm sure that many of my friends and relatives visited my loved ones on this day and outed themselves in cheering and entertaining them. Shehad Muluk came to see me and said that he had spoken of my case and that he was told to submit a petition and that he would help. In the afternoon, Mr. Badir Sunu visited me and brought a package with four pieces of Qatayev sweets and a dish of kibbe. He told me that his uncle and my teacher had gone to meet the patriarch and that they had submitted my petition to him. Then Taufi Jawhariye visited me and I gave him my tarbush to be ironed. He returned later with a Nahar newspaper and then Rustom Bey came to visit me and reassured me. Thank God that I am not being neglected. I hope that my loved ones receive from my friends all that I am receiving here. August 9th, 1929. 
It is seven in the morning. I'm looking from the train's window. But unlike being at home in the countryside, where the grass ought to be sparkling with dew, the flowers enriching the air with their fragrance, and the birds singing in the trees. But alas, there is no dew here, no flowers, no birds, no trees. There is a plain and unshaded lake, and beyond them some barren mountains. The carriages are tumbling. The Arabs are quarreling like dogs and cats. The train's carriage is our camp now, as we reach the city walls of Tiberias. We went into the town before nightfall and looked at its people. We cared nothing about its houses. Its people are best examined at a distance. They are particularly uncommonly Jews, Arabs, and Negroes. Squalor and poverty are the uh, pride of Tiberias. Damascus, Thursday, 10th of January, 1929. After bathing with cold water in the roofed gallery, I prepared to go to the French High Commissioner's office. At nine, I went accompanied by a guard, but not chained. Thank God! I was released and left with Mr. Tadros, who was waiting for me there, and since it was dark, we bumped around randomly. Mr. Tadros and his family were overjoyed at my release, as if I was their bro our, his brother. He bought sweets along the way in celebration of my freedom. The kindness I encountered from his wife when I entered the house nearly brought tears to my eyes. Then my teacher and Khairi Afandi Al-Farran came and we exchanged kisses. As soon as I entered Mr. Tadros' home, I was bombarded with memories of the day we visited them in Jerusalem. August 10th. 1929. In the early morning, one watches the silent battle of dawn and darkness upon the waters of the Sea of Galilee with a very pl placid interest. But when the shadows sulk away and the shore unfolds, this is not an ingenious picture. It is the worst I ever saw. I can describe it in elaborate details, what it terms biblically a, ter a terrestrial paradise, and I can close with a startling information that this paradise is a sense of desolation and misery. It is solitude for bare, bare birds and squirrels on the shore, and fishes in the water are all the creatures that are nearly to make it otherwise. But it is not the sort of solitude to make one dreary, Come to Galilee for that? If these unpeopled deserts, these rusty months of burnness, that never, never, never do shake the glare from their harsh outlines and fade and fade into vague perspective, that melancholy ruin of Capernaum, this stupid village of Tiberias, slumbering under its six funeral plums of palms, this cloudless, blistering sky, this solemn, sailless, tintless lake, reposing without its rim of yellow hills and low, steep banks, and looking just as The train stopped in Jerusalem. I walk the streets of my beloved city. I'm eager to drink my morning coffee with my wife and sister, and smoke and write and breathe the whole afternoon the daily copy of Al-Sharq and Al-Muqtabas newspapers. I want to do all of my exercises and then bathe well as in my habit. In the evening, I will visit friends and drink a little arak, and then retire to my bed early like every day. Thank you.